my honor and privilege to present to you our evangelist, Dr. Tom Hermes. And thank you, Pastor. Thank you very much. And uh, I was delighted to see that hardly anyone here had ever heard me preach before. That means I can preach anything I want to and not uh, be too concerned that everybody's heard it before. But um, I think I've only been in Hurricane one other time. That was a number of years ago. I was out at the Wesleyan camp meeting for one service, and uh, there had not been a hurricane, but there had been a tornado. And I remember preaching there at the tabernacle without any, any uh, power. Well, I did have some power from above, but no power from below. And uh, that's been my only experience in, in this particular community. So it's nice to be here. And I've enjoyed talking to your pastor over the phone. And uh, he certainly knows how to make somebody feel welcome. I, uh, several months ago, some, one of my staff members at the office started talking to me about the Lohr family. And uh, so um, I, we looked them up, uh, we went to their webpage and we listened to them and we liked what we heard. And so we called them and tried to schedule them for our Mount of Praise uh, Partners Banquet and they had something else scheduled. So uh, we'll keep trying and uh, one of these days we'll have you up uh, in Circleville for uh, one, of our, one of our events. I guess we were together uh, some years ago and just shows you what age does to your memory. And uh, you made a profound impact on me because <laughs> I had no recollection whatsoever. But, but it, anyway, uh, I apologize for that and never should have said it. But anyway, I just kind of say whatever comes into my mind. That's what my wife tells me, but uh, gets me in trouble. Not as much trouble as Mr. Trump gets into by saying whatever gets into his mind, but nevertheless. But uh, it's a joy to be here. I have looked forward to it. And um, we're just believing God for a real move of the Holy Spirit. If there's ever been a time when we needed revival in America, it is indeed right now. And so we're just going to trust God to do something special in our midst. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Acts and chapter 1. And while you're turning to that, um, a number of years ago, there was a famous professional baseball player that was playing in the major leagues. His name was Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday was a very gifted athlete and played for several major league teams. Uh, but his problem was he had a drinking problem that shortened his career. Sometime after his career was finished, he found Christ as his Savior. And Billy Sunday became one of the most unique, powerful, gifted evangelists in our nation at that point in time in our history. He went into a city to begin a crusade, and a lady came up to him, and she said, I want you to know, Mr. Sunday, I don't believe in revivals. And he said, well, why not? And she said, because they don't last. And he said, well, ma'am, neither does a bath but you need to take one once in a while. I thought of that story the other day when the guy sat down next to me on the airplane and I would that he would have somehow remembered to take a bath that day because it, it was a little overwhelming. But the reality is you do need to take a bath once in a while and the reality is that in our walk with God there are times when all of us come to a point when we need to be renewed, refreshed, revived. We need the fire within us to be rekindled. And that's why your pastor believes in revival because we understand that in this world that is not friendly to grace there are times when the trials and the tribulations, the tests of life, just all of those things that clamor for our attention, they somehow can gnaw away in, in our lives and we might find ourselves cooling off. So we're here on the king's business and we are here to witness the moving of God once again. So if you have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 1, I'm going to ask you to stand, if you will, for the reading of God's word. can hardly think of a better place to begin a weekend revival than in the book of Acts. And we'll begin right at verse 1 of chapter 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up 
after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. From this passage, I want us to look for a few moments at what I believe is the most desperate, urgent need in the body of Christ. The most desperate, urgent need in the church of the Nazarene. The most desperate, urgent need in the churches of Christ in Christian union. The most desperate need that we have in the body of Christ. We're going to go to bottom line stuff and that's where we will begin. You may be seated and may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. In these verses, Jesus is sharing his final message. His last words with his disciples before ascending back to heaven. Therefore, I believe that we can conclude that these were words that were very carefully and specifically chosen. These are extremely important words that demand our thoughtful consideration and obedience. In light of what Jesus knew to be the most desperate, urgent need of his disciples, he gave them a very specific command. Do not leave Jerusalem. But wait, wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The promise of the father is found in Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 27 when God said there was going to come a day when he would pour out his Holy Spirit on all flesh. And in that promise. He said that he would put his spirit within us. Not simply coming upon us once in a while for some momentous occasion in our lives, but the day would come when the believers could experience a constant, continual, indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And now Jesus is about to leave this earth and ascend back to heaven. He is leaving the work of the church of his kingdom in the hands of his disciples. And he uses a word. I guarantee you, you will never hear it at a church growth conference. He said, wait. Just wait. Don't even think about going out and doing ministry. And in so many words, he was saying to them, because you're not ready. Not ready? I mean, these people, these men, had been with Jesus day and night for three years. They had listened to just about every sermon he'd ever preached. They'd watched him perform miracle after miracle. And as they walked the dusty trails of Galilee, they had had the opportunity to ask him countless numbers of questions. <clears throat> now, after three years of on-the-job training with the master teacher preacher, the master looks at them and is saying, you're not ready. Don't even think about going out and trying to cast out demons and raise up the dead and, and perform miracles of healing. Don't even think about it. You're not ready. He knew that their desperate need was for them to come to a point where they would empty themselves and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus knew excuse me, that this was absolutely essential if the church was to survive and thrive. Today we look at the church 
And we're inclined at times to think, you know, well, what we really need is better organizational structure. And if we could just get structured right and get a good game plan and have our goals and a good pithy vision statement, we could really do something for God. And after spending decades of my life in trying to lead different organizations, I understand the value, the importance, the necessity of good structure and having a good game plan and of having plans and goals and a vision statement. But ladies and gentlemen, I've come to remind you, God does not move on goals and God does not move on structures. God moves in and through people. And with the greatest, most desperate, urgent, need in the body of Christ is not for another planning session as important as that can be but the most important thing that we can do in the body of Christ is to empty ourselves and be baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire that is the most desperate urgent need in the body of Christ Sometimes we look at the church and we come to the conclusion well if we just had a little more talent around here and, and if our people just had a little more training, then we could really do something for God. And I value talent and training, make no mistake. In fact, sometimes I get some places where they don't have much of either one, and you really, you really kind of miss it. In fact, I went to hold a revival meeting here several years ago and, and uh, went into this church and uh, the dear lady who was playing the organ, so you know this was a few years ago and we still had organs. I don't know if you have one here or not. Doesn't, most churches don't anymore. But anyway, this was a long time ago and they had the dear lady who played the organ was now in her 80s. No problem with that. But she could only play by note and she was nearly blind. The lady who played the piano was also in her 80s. No problem with that. Her problem, though, was she could only play by ear and she was almost stone deaf. Every song we sang that week, the piano and the organ were in two different keys. I'm sitting in the middle of the platform. It is hurting my ears. One time in that revival, I think by some chance they got in the same key. And believe it or not, the piano and organ were so far out of tune with each other that it still hurt my ears. And if that wasn't enough, the, the pastor of that church had been in a horrific automobile accident. And it left him with some kind of an injury that when he would sweat, he would only sweat on one side of his face. I'm sitting here listening to this music and watching this pastor sweat dripping off one side of his face and the other side of his face is completely dry. And I thought, you know, this is better than just about any big show on television to be able to come and experience this. One night he got to crying and tears only came out of one eye and they were flowing and the other eye was dry. One night he blew his nose. I looked the other way. I really didn't care. That was kind of gross. I didn't care if both sides were working or not. If that wasn't enough, I get up to play my trumpet for the offering. I'm coming down to the end of the song and a lady from the back of the church with very disheveled in her appearance, appearance with flaming red hair came staggering up the aisle. She had a brown sack in her hand. There were spirits in that bag. And that was not the Holy Spirit, it was alcoholic spirits. And she came staggering up the aisle, she gets to the front, she leans across the altar and hands me a dollar bill, and she said, boy, that was beautiful, I want to give you a dollar. Well, I, I was completely caught by surprise. I had never experienced that one before. And I, I was embarrassed and caught off guard. I said, oh, no, 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 no. Just put it there in the offering plate. Just put it in the offering. Oh, she said, you think you're too good to take my money. And she proceeded to cuss me out right there in the front of the church. I turned to the pastor. I said, man, she's all yours. And I looked and he was now sweating on both sides of his face. It was an absolute miracle. Absolutely amazing. He was sweating so much in that moment. So I want to tell you, I value talent and I value training. But I must tell you, all of the talent and training in the world will never take the place of the anointing and 
and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Nothing can take the place of that. And as, so our most desperate need today is for the people of God to empty ourselves. It's the only way we can experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We must come to a point where we're crucified with Christ. We must come to a place of an absolute total abandonment of our will, of our all to God. And it is then and only then that we can experience His sanctifying grace and the infilling with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we sit around and we evaluate the church and we think, you know, what we really need is better doctrine, better terminology. And so we sit around trying to come up with user-friendly doctrines that will not offend anybody and that will be politically correct. Well, may God help us. We don't need to worry about being politically correct. We need to be concerned about being biblically correct. And I want to just pause here and say, ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing wrong with Wesleyan, Arminian doctrine and theology. And in case you've forgotten, that is the doctrine and the theology of the Church of the Nazarene. Don't ever forget that and hold to that and stand on that. I've had the opportunity to study all the great systematic theologies, just about all of the major ones that exist. And I must tell you, and I'm not biased or prejudiced one little bit, but I must tell you, there is no systematic theology, there is no doctrine that is any more systematic, any more consistent, any more biblical than Wesleyan Arminian doctrine. Our problem is not our doctrine. Our problem is not our terminology. Terms can be explained. I mean, every time we go to the doctor, we have to get out a dictionary to find out what in the world they're talking about and what is this medicine that they're prescribing for us. We can learn the things about terminology. Our problem is we need to experience it. Amen. And we need to live it. We need to put it into practice. And that's what's desperately needed today is for the people of our churches to empty themselves as they did in that upper room and be filled with the Holy Spirit. No, oh, in, in the dumbing down of America, in case you hadn't noticed, you know, we used to be number one in the world when it came, comes to education. But we have fallen so far it's shocking. We're down someplace 28th or 29th or 30th in the world today when it comes to the quality of our education. And yet we pour millions and millions of dollars into this and we're not getting better. We're going in the wrong direction. May God help us. And I'm not here to preach about education tonight. But what I am here to say in the dumbing down of America, we have a lot of churches now that love to say, well, we don't preach doctrine at our church. We just preach Jesus. You know, on the surface, that sounds so good. But when you stop and think about it, it's one of the dumbest statements anyone can ever make. I hope you haven't made it, because I, I would not want to think there's anyone here that's dumb. But nevertheless, it's a dumb statement. If you preach Jesus... No, no, if you really preach Jesus, you're going to preach some doctrine. Now the question is going to be, is it going to be good doctrine or bad doctrine? Is it going to be systematic and consistent, or is it just going to be a hodgepodge of what I think about this and what somebody else thinks about it, or what the most famous television preacher thinks? Is it going to be biblical and consistent? And so, ladies and gentlemen, we need to come to the place where we understand our problem is not our doctrine. It needs to be taught and proclaimed and lived. And then there's one more I've just mentioned before we move on. The big one today is if we could just figure out how we're going to worship. If we could just get our worship style figured out, we could really impact this community and do something for God. So we have these big debates are we going to sing choruses or are we going to sing hymns? Are we going to sing out of the hymn book or are we going to sing off the wall? Are we going to have a blend? Are we going to be formal or are we going to be casual? Are we going to wear suits and ties or are we going to come to church with golf shoes, shirts and dockers and flip-flops on? And so we have these big discussions. Here's all I want to say about that. And I know that will disappoint some of you a whole lot. But here's what I want to say. If we would be half as concerned 
about getting our people to a point of that absolute surrender and the in experiencing the infilling of the Holy Spirit as we are about some of these other things, we could turn this world upside down. We could have a sweeping revival that could change the course of history, which desperately needs to be done. I'm saying to you, I'm going to bottom line stuff tonight. All of these things are important. All of them are worthy of our discussion and our thoughts and our prayers. But we, the thing that is most important seems to get the least amount of our attention. May God help us to get our priorities back on track. Well, the wonderful thing about it is these disciples were obedient and they followed some very detailed preparation. They obeyed the command of Christ. They stayed in that upper room in constant prayer, seeking the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now think about this. If they had grown impatient and had failed to obey, they would have not received the infilling with the Holy Spirit. And without the Holy Spirit, the church cannot survive. Oh, you can pack out a building and you can impress the world with your size, but the church, the body of Christ, cannot survive without the Holy Spirit. There are lots of people that try it and they put something together, but ladies and gentlemen, what we need today is a church that has been set on fire by the Spirit of the living Christ. And there is no substitute for obedience. There's no personal Pentecost without obedience. There's no infilling with the Holy Spirit without obedience. There is no entire sanctification without obedience. So I've come to ask you this question tonight. Are you walking in all the light that God has given you? We sign our own spiritual death warrant when we fail to obey the divine command to wait for our own Pentecost. And this is the reason we have so many barren, sterile Christians and churches, is because we have not taken time to wait before God. D.L. Moody, the great preacher, put it this way, you might as well try to see without eyes and hear without ears and breathe without lungs as to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. So just very quickly, look what the disciples did. First of all, verse 13, they secluded themselves. They got away from all distractions and went into that upper room. Verse 14, they waited. They refused to settle for some kind of a weak substitute. And sometimes, friends, in our holiness churches, we have settled for something other than the infilling with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we've substituted legalism for the Holy Spirit. You know, and, and it's all about just looking a certain way, dressing a certain way, having a series of do's and don'ts. And when you conform to that series of do's and don'ts and you look a certain way and stay away from certain places, then you're holy. There's only one problem. You can do all of those things and be as carnal as a heathen in Africa. And you can't stop there. You stop short if you just line up and conform to a bunch of externals. And then there have been times in our history when we have substituted emotionalism for the Holy Spirit. And we have thought if we could jump high enough and run fast enough and dance well enough and if we could just be loud enough and baptize everybody in the front rows with our saliva and preach loud enough, then that, that was holiness. It's not enough. You can still do all of those things and be very, very carnal. And oh, the big one today is, I mean, we have become the most faddish nation. I mean, we've totally lost our way. And we just jump from one thing to another. You remember, it was just a few years ago now. They had something going on up in Toronto, Canada. It was called the Toronto Blessing. And the people up there in one of those big mega churches, they got to mooing like cows roaring like lions, laughing like hyenas. 
And everybody said, this is the new wave. This is the new fresh movement of the Holy Spirit. And you could hardly book a hotel in Toronto, Canada, because tens of thousands of people were coming from all over the world to learn how to move like cows and roar like lions and laugh like hyenas and roll around on the floor. You know, I didn't have to go to church to learn how to do that. I learned how to do that when my kids were little. We, we used to go through all those sounds, you know, riding down the road in a car. It's the way we entertained each other, trying to roar like a lion and to moo like a cow and to laugh like a hyena. But those folks thought they had to go to church to do that. It was called the Toronto Blessing. And now that's dead, that's buried. I mean, after thousands of people came, you, it was hard to book a flight into Toronto. It was absolutely insane. And now that's gone by. And now there's something else, and tomorrow there'll be something else. We just jump from one fad to another. We have no moorings. We have no base. We have no center. Our center is the Word of God. And then we must come back to the foundations that have made the church what it is. And it's only when we come back to that and empty ourselves and are filled with the Holy Spirit that we shall experience this great blessing of God. Notice that they prayed. They didn't gather to grumble. They didn't gather to complain. They didn't even come together to eat. They didn't even come together for fellowship. They came to seek the face of God. And the word said they were in one accord of one mind. They wanted the promise of the Father. How much did they want it? They wanted it more than a drowning man wants air. They wanted it more than a starving person wants food. They wanted it more than a thirsty person wants water. They longed for the presence of God. And I ask you, where has that intense desire and passion for the presence of God, where has it gone? You know, and I don't want to be misunderstood, but we are very good today at seeking out religious entertainment. We become very good at that. And now look, we live in a day when there's a lot of stress and a lot of pressure. And, and if, if you can go someplace and get some religious entertainment, God bless you. But here's my problem. My problem is it's very much an indication of the shallowness that exists in the body of Christ. You say, well, what are you talking about? Well, just announce that there's going to be a gospel concert and watch us pack the place out. Amen. Then say, we're going to have a prayer meeting, just a plain old fashioned prayer meeting and see what happens. Now look, there's nothing wrong with the gospel concert. I don't want to be misunderstood at this point. But the reality is, it is an indication of where we are in the body of Christ. And we need to come to a point where we long for the presence and the power of Almighty God. And it's, you let a missionary come and we'll stay home in droves. When we ought to be seeking the face of God. Ladies and gentlemen, we need revival. We need a moving of the Holy Spirit desperately in this day. Well, the good thing about Acts is the fact that in the second chapter, we see they got the desired results. It said when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And all of them, I love that, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were earnestly seeking God when the fire fell and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Two powerful things happened that I'll mention very briefly. When they were filled with the Holy Spirit, their hearts were purified. We've almost lost this truth today, in, even in our holiness churches. We hear very little about the deeper cleansing of the blood of Christ that can deliver us from that inherited sinful disposition that we often call the carnal mind. 
Peter testified about this. Chapter 15, he said, God put no difference between us and them, referring to the Jews and the Gentiles. But yet, and then he said, and purifying their hearts by faith. The thing that stood out to Peter about the infilling of the Holy Spirit was not the sound of a rushing mighty wind. It was not the cloven tongues like fire that sat upon each of them. It was not even the fact that everybody heard the message in their own language. It was the fact that their hearts, when they were filled, their hearts were purified by faith. The psalmist talked about it. Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. The Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I want you to know, folks, you can have a heart that's clean and pure. You don't have to go around trying to suppress that sinful disposition. You don't have to go around sinning and repenting and sinning and repenting. There is something better than that. And I want to urge you to never quit sinking until you come to the place where you are all God's, not 99%, but 100%, abandoned to Him, emptying yourself so that He can cleanse you and fill you with His Holy Spirit. And the second thing that happened on that day of Pentecost, they received power. It was promised in Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And they started to witness. They began to preach with great power and boldness. No denying Christ now. No hiding behind walls now. But they went out and in the power of the Holy Spirit boldly proclaimed the resurrection of Christ without concern for their lives. Thousands were swept into the kingdom and they literally turned the world upside down. Now think about this. No structure None whatsoever. We have a structure coming out of our ears. But they didn't have any structure. They didn't have any money. No money. No status in the world. No prestige whatsoever. They didn't even have a building. All they had was Holy Spirit power. And how we desperately need that infilling, that baptism with the Holy Spirit. And I've come to tell you tonight, you can be filled with God's Holy Spirit and have power over the world and over the flesh and over the devil. Power to witness. A passion for souls. And a passion for Christ-likeness. This, my friends, is the bottom line, desperate, urgent need in our holiness churches. To empty ourselves and be filled, to have pure hearts that are set on fire with a passion to reach the lost. D.L. Moody, great preacher of the previous generation, was short, stocky, and uneducated. In fact, he butchered the king's English so much that if he ever wrote something, his friends would try to capture it before it went in the mail so they could correct his terrible grammar. But D.L. Moody ended up, in spite of all of that, preaching to more people in the 19th century than anyone else. In his pastorate as a young pastor in Chicago, he was blessed to have Sister Cook and Auntie Snow in his congregation. They were free Methodist ladies. Now, why they were attending his church, I do not know, but they were attending his church in Chicago. And they perceived that their young pastor, D.L. Moody, had not been filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, every Sunday morning, as they go out the back door and shake the hand of the preacher, they'd say, Pastor Moody, we perceive you are not yet filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're praying for you every day. I want to tell you, that'll psych a preacher up big time. And, and then when he'd get up to preach, they'd listen to him a few minutes and they'd look at each other and just sh sadly shake their heads this way. I want to tell you, that really doesn't do much to inspire the preacher. Well, finally, his church burned to the ground in the great fire. And now he had reached a point in his life where he realized that he needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He realized the emptiness that was in his own soul. And he'd been praying and seeking for days and for weeks. 
Now he's in New York City in 1871, and he's walking down Wall Street in 1871, and he's crying out to God. He was there on a fundraising tour, trying to raise funds to go back and rebuild his church in Chicago that had been burned down by the fire. And he was on a fundraising tour, but he was seeking God. And right there on Wall Street, God heard his prayer and poured out his spirit into the heart of this young minister. I was walking down Wall Street a while back, and I thought, how in the world, in all of these chaos, in all of this chaos, could anybody, could heaven and earth come together, and could somebody be filled with the Holy Spirit? But that's what happened that day. It was such an overwhelming experience that Moody rushed back to his hotel, was prostrate on the floor, and he said, wave after wave of the glory of God flowed through his soul until finally he was exhausted. And he said, please, God, would you just back off a little while? I think I'm about to explode. Now, look, it doesn't always happen that way. So don't look for that in your experience. But this is the way it happened in the life of D.L. Moody. Well, he goes back to his church. He had not yet had the opportunity to tell anyone of what had happened on Wall Street several days before. He gets up to preach. He'd only been preaching a few minutes. Then Sister Cook and Auntie Snow looked at each other. Big smiles came on their faces, and they began to nod their heads this way. They didn't know the story, but they knew somewhere, someplace, sometime, their prayers had been answered, and their young pastor had experienced the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And D.L. Moody said, I preach the same sermons it was one of the more comforting things I read in his testimony. He said, I preached the same sermons, but now there was a freshness. Now there was an anointing. Now there was a power. And D.L. Moody preached to more people in that century than any other one person and became a dynamic, powerful soul winner leading tens of thousands of people to Christ. It's amazing when you get rid of yourself. I mean, really, just get rid of yourself. It's amazing how it takes away a lot of your fears, a lot of your timidity, a lot of your weakness. Because you just know you belong to God and that His Spirit dwells within you. With this I close, just very briefly. Way back in college days, I was invited to hold a weekend revival in a church in Zumbrota, Minnesota. I don't know if anyone here has been in Zumbrota, Minnesota. Minnesota, if you haven't, don't worry about it. I mean, I think they have about four weeks of summer up there, and the, it's pretty, pretty cold up there, but a beautiful part of the country. Well, I get in there on a Friday night, and I sensed, even as young as I was, I sensed that there was division in that church. And the next day in a conversation with the pastor, it became very clear that he and his wife were just, just worn out. There, there was so much hostility that some people would come and sit on one side and some on the other side, not because that was their favorite seat, but because they didn't want to speak to each other. And you could cut it like a knife. Well, in the last service of that weekend meeting, I brought just a very simple, basic, fundamental message on entire sanctification. What is it? What will it do for you? What will it not do for you? How can you know that you have been entirely sanctified? Very simple message. When I gave the invitation, there was a lady sitting about halfway back that had not been there in any of the other services, but she'd been invited by one of the ladies of the church to come with her. She, I found out later, was a member of the local Lutheran church. She had never been in a holiness church before in her life. And she had never heard a sermon on a second work of grace. And when I gave the invitation, she was the first one at the altar. I remember it well because she was the only one at the altar. I think they all needed to be, but she was the only one. I went down to pray with her. And I love, to, I love to tell this because it reminds me I was young once. She said to me, young man, I want you to know I love Jesus. She said, when I was a little girl, I fell in love with Jesus. I gave him my heart. I gave him my life. I've tried to do everything my church has taught me to do. I'm in church regularly and faithfully. I give of my tithes and my offerings. 
Wow, she was, she was way ahead of some of us, some, some in the holiness movement. But she said, I've paid my tithes and my offering. And she said, I've tried to walk in all the light that I've had. But she said, tonight I heard a message that I'd never heard before. And she said, I sat there listening, thinking, and praying, multitasking. And she said, every, and she said I wondered why I was here and why I was hearing this. And it was, she said, and every point that you would make, I would breathe a prayer to God. Is this truth? Is this biblical? Or is this heresy? And she said, it just seemed to me that every point that you made, the Holy Spirit was bearing witness with my spirit that what I was hearing was truth and was biblical. And that's why I was here tonight, to hear this message that God wanted me to experience this. And she said, I want you to know, I am now not only a saved, but I'm a sanctified Lutheran. She said, I settled the question. I want everything God has for me. That has been my passion, she said, ever since I got saved. I wanted everything God has for me. I didn't want to stop short. I didn't want to be a nominal Christian. I didn't want to be lukewarm. I wanted to be out and out for God. And God revealed to me the need of my heart. And she said, as of this moment, I want you to know, I am now a sanctified Lutheran. Now, I share that for this reason. Just think of this for a moment. It was the first sermon she'd ever heard in her life on a second work of grace. The very first time she'd ever heard of it. And she sees her heart and her need, and she seeks God. It's amazing. But I want to ask you, how many sermons have you heard on a second work of grace? You know, if you've been around here, you've heard a lot of them. So that leads me to the next question. Have you experienced it? Do you know the reality of this deeper cleansing and this infilling with the Holy Spirit? If not, why not? I believe that once a person's genuinely saved, and we don't know when the light comes, but when a person's genuinely saved and God reveals truth to you, to the indication that you're a child of God is that you will want everything God has for you. And when the light comes, you will not back up, you will not hesitate, but you will walk in the light and God will meet the need of your heart. I meet people every day that have been filled with the Spirit, they're sanctified holy, and they didn't even have a name for it. It happened at some time in the past when they got hungry hungry for God as a believer and began to seek the Lord and the Lord came and met this need in their heart and they never heard a sermon on it but they'd experienced the reality of it and when it was explained to them oh yes that's what happened to me back there four or five years ago or 10 or 15 years ago I've never been the same since that day this is not rocket science it is truth it is the word of God and if you want everything God has for you don't stop until you know the reality of the blessing of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now here's the invitation. We're going to sing that beautiful little chorus. Come Holy Spirit, I need you. And here, here's the invitation. There are times, and this is why we have revivals. There are times when sanctified people need a fresh touch, a fresh anointing, a fresh infilling. It happened in the book of Acts between chapter 2 and chapter 4. And it still happens today. And church, if you sense a need of a fresh touch from God, I want you to lead the way when we open up this altar. I want you to lead the way and come and ask God for that fresh infilling of His Spirit. The cares of life, the burdens of life, the heartaches of life, the chaos of life. It just sometimes has a way of draining us and sapping us. And there are times when we just need a fresh touch from God. And church, I believe if you 
are sensing that, if you'll lead the way as we sing this little chorus, I believe there's some others here tonight that this could be a red letter day in their lives. This could be the day when they experience their own personal Pentecost. This could be the moment when they walk this aisle and bow at an altar to prayer and surrender their all and experience God's sanctifying grace in the infilling of His Holy Spirit. Let's stand quietly and reverently together, Lord Jesus, in these next few moments. May Your Holy Spirit descend upon us. Say what I can't say. Say what I wouldn't know how, what to say. Lord Jesus, speak to us. Show us our hearts. We believe we are here tonight on business. We want to hear from you. We want to hear from heaven. And Father, give people the courage to just be obedient in these next few moments and step out and come and make their way to this place of prayer. The altar is open now, friends. Come and let's meet us here. Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Come in thy strength and thy power. Come in thy own gentle way. Sing it again, will you mind him? Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Come in thy strength and thy power. Come in thine own gentle way. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, thank God for this beautiful scene. The saints of God just wanting something new and fresh from the Lord. Some may be kneeling here and wanting to just surrender their all and experience this deeper cleansing. So church, if you want to gather in around for a time of prayer, I want us to call on God now and we're going to ask Him to do what only He can do. This is the work of God and it's only God that can do this. So we're going to sing it one more time and if you want to join us for this prayer meeting, step out and come right now. Sing it together. Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Come in thy strength and thy power. Join me now in this season of prayer. Father, we thank you for this beautiful scene. We thank you for the people of God that want to be everything you would have them to be. They've been spoiled for the world a long time ago. But the cares and the burdens and the trials and tests of life have a way sometimes of just causing that fire to diminish just a bit. So, Father, would you come now in this moment and breathe afresh and anew upon us. Touch my own heart, Lord. Breathe upon me afresh and anew as I have sought you this day and every day asking you for that fresh anointing and infilling. I come before you again today and say, without you, Lord, we are nothing. But through you, we can do all things. And so, Father, would you come right now and give us that fresh touch, that fresh infilling. Let the fire in our hearts burn as never before. Cleanse us, purify us, deliver us from our ego, from our self-centeredness, from our selfish ambition. And may we truly become Christ-centered, sanctified, spirit-filled disciples of the cross. Then, Lord... I want to believe there are some bowing here 
that this can be the day of their own personal Pentecost. This can be the moment, their own upper room and moment. This can be the day when they say that big yes and you can come and take the gift that they are surrendering to you and you can cleanse it and fill it with your Holy Spirit. Lord, do it just now. You're more anxious to give us the gift of the Holy Spirit than we are to give good gifts to our children. We don't have to beg you. We don't have to plead with you. We just have to die. And Lord, that's the problem. Help us to come to the point where we are truly crucified with Christ so that you can come and cleanse us and fill us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for all that we've heard and sensed in this service tonight. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Blessed be his name. Lead us in that, Brother Lore, would you please? Thank you. Yes, there is. Blessed be his name. Yes. Oh, yes. Bless his name. And I know it's Spirit of the Lord. Yes, yes, yes. Blessed be his name. Sing it together. Sweet expressions on each face. And I know that it's the spirits of the Lord. Yes, sing it together. Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, heavenly dove, stay right here with us. Yes, right here with us, filling us. This with your love. Amen. Amen. And for these blessings, we lift our hearts in praise. Without a doubt, we'll know, yes, we have been revived. When we shall leave this Place. Oh, hallelujah. I'm, I'm so glad that I can get out of the office and come to church on a Friday night. I mean, I go in there and I go through all that stuff, but I want to tell you the thing that charges my batteries and keeps me going is the f come to be able to come to meetings like this and sense the fellowship of the saints and the presence of the Lord. And that's what recharges us and rekindles us. And I believe God wants to do something special this weekend. Let's just keep our hearts open, our cup turned up right, and God's gonna come. He will not disappoint his people when we have a hunger for his presence. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Pastor, what do you want to say? Church board meeting. Church board meeting. Oh, my goodness. Sorry, folks. He knows how to kill a meeting in a hurry. Go to board meeting. God bless you. Shake hands and you're dismissed.